Hello and welcome to the EDH RecCast. My name is Joey Schultz and I'm joined as always by my fantastic co-hosts. Up first, he doesn't understand why regular Power Stone tokens make less mana than a worn Power Stone. It's Matt Morgan. You know, Joey, I, I never really did that well in school. Actually, I can't even count the amount of times I failed math. I can't even count what okay oh, no. i'm sorry yeah, just, to hear that matt um <laughs> i mean just start with a little self-deprecating humor um get things started off on the left foot on the left foot not even on the right foot <laughs> yeah I, I was not good at science either <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing all right up next i told him that i was going to build an urza deck and he said which one and so i told him the new one and he was like joey you have clarified nothing it's dana roach uh, why is Santa so good at karate? Oh, I, I dread to learn why. He's got a black belt. You know what? I suppose I suppose that's true. That's that's how he slays all his foes. <laughs> <laughs> who who spends more time boxing than Santa? I couldn't. I don't. The Canadians. Does... They have a whole day for it. <laughs> well, oh, wow. oh wow! Nice. <laughs> well done. Um. I don't know what to do with myself, but I'm just going to keep introducing the rest of the show, I think, if that's okay. Anyway, this is the EDH Rec cast, question mark. EDH Rec is the best deck building resource on the web for the commander format, compiling data from deck lists all over the internet to provide helpful recommendations for new commander decks. And here on the EDH Rec cast, what we'd like to do is give all of that data a little more context. Matt, can you tell us what it is that we're going to be discussing in this week's episode? So this week, we're going to talk about the power of reprints and how they impact not just the, the financial implications, but getting them into decks and how, you know what that looks like and some stats behind the reprints. Oh, yeah. This will be very interesting. Kind of a, a continuation of what we talked about last week, only we're going to take a look at some really big jumps. When cards finally get meaningful reprints, how many more decks do they show up in? There's some exciting data in this episode. I'm, I'm really happy that we're going to get to it. But before we can get to it, we've got some quick shout outs that we got to do, huh? First, I'd like to thank Chase, also known as Mana Curves, for their help editing the show. You can find them on Twitter at Mana Curves. And you can support the show by liking and subscribing this video on YouTube, subscribing on your local podcast app, or if you want to go to patreon.com slash edhretcast, you can do that as well. We have patron tiers of all sorts of levels. Whether you want to join the Discord community that we have going on, whether you want to see all the historic challenge stats, or even see all the episodes a whole day early, you can do all of that and more over at patreon.com slash edhretcast. And as always, we're going to give that special patron shout out to somebody who just went to that website and subscribed and su supported us. So this week, Simon Grip, we're going to grip it and rip it with giving you the shout out. <laughs> so thank you so much for the show. It's, it's a baseball term, Joe. It's a baseball term. Don't I know that one. I knew that one. Thank you. Well, thank it, you. It's There's sports and I know sports balls don't always compute in your, your head brain. But I do understand when we get support from awesome listeners. So Simon Grip. Like Simon. Yes, Simon Grip. Thank you so, so much for the support and for giving Matt the opportunity to educate me about the baseball, um, which is very good for me, I'm sure. Anyway, let's get right back into our topic. I want to get to this. We were talking about the power of reprints, specifically like the statistical significance when a card finally gets a reprint after a long time how many decks it starts to show up in after that. And I think a really important quick clarifying note for us to get to when we're talking about the numbers here is that we're looking at the data as like a before and after for like meaningful reprints, you know, like we're not talking about like, oh, Mystic Remora got a secret layer reprint. Like that doesn't count, you know, like that's that's the thing we got to say. We're talking about like actually accessible reprints is maybe the best way to, I think we can say it. Yeah, um, it, it's, it's one of those things where like there are so many strange reprint venues right now, but a lot of them don't necessarily make a difference in how many cards hit people's hands, whether it's the list or talking about secret layers. They help, don't get me wrong. I, I would rather have there be as many reprint venues as possible, but some of them just don't put enough cards out there to actually really impact prices at all. Yeah. Yeah, the, the two big ones that I know Wizards of the Coast is very proud of, and, and they are good ideas. Between secret layers and the list, like Dana mentioned, I don't think that they're they're not helping prices. They're preventing them from getting worse, but they're not actively helping them just because mm. it's so hard to get a hold of copies. It's very limited. I I think we can all agree here that secret layers and the list and some of those types of reprints, 
they count, but not really. I, I think that's that's probably that's a very diplomatic way for you to say it. Matt. For yeah. me, I'm just like, no, they don't count. It's just like put them in an actual like I want them in a set set. Yes. Um, I'm not mad that they have the other stuff in the secret layer at all. But like, I do want these cards to be more accessible to people and yada, yada. So let's that's more of the like the data that we'll be able to track with how big some of these swings are. That's a clarifying point that is important for us to note before we get going. And also, as with last week, the way that we're measuring this is comparing the current data for the most recent two year chunk that EDHREC is measuring. So 2020 to 2022 against the data from a previous two-year chunk, that being 2018 to 2020. So that's going to be the the scale for the before and after. Um, and uh, I, I can't even hide being cheeky about this one. The first example, the most impressive example that we're going to get into here, Dana, we got to just hand it right to you because I know how happy you were when this card got reprinted and the number change on it is still Staggering, dude. Yeah. So, so the first one here we're going to touch on is is three visits, um, which is really similar to the card nature's lore in that it's exactly the same as the card nature's lore. <laughs> it's just not titled nature's lore. It's three visits. You can tutor up at sorcery speed a forest card and put it directly into play untapped. So not only can you get a basic forest, you can go get a any of the dual lands that have the forest subtype and put them straight into play. It's, it was a card that, um, after the reprint, <laughs> increased about 8,500% in, <laughs> in, its, in, in its appearance in decks. I, I mean, that, that's, a, that's four digits. <laughs> that's, I don't even know what, like, the, what the factor that is. It's just an insane amount of decks that went up in. And uh, there, there's a couple of reasons for that. Number one, it was from such an obscure set, P Portal Three Kingdoms, that had so few English language printings. A lot of people probably didn't know it existed for, for starters. And number two, it was about a $100 card for something that was not necessarily that impactful. I, I like the card and run it in all of my decks, but like... There are cards that you can maybe justify spending a good amount of money on based on their power. Nature's Lore was not, a Nature's Lore, second version of Nature's Lore was <laughs> absolutely not one of them. No. Um, so yeah, that, that's a card that, that people both became aware of and it became affordable going from, I think it was around $100 at the peak before the reprint down to like you were able to pick them up for, for I think foil copies or $2 shortly after it first came out. Wow. I, I remember buying several foil copies for, yeah, like $3, I think it was. But it, I know I said I'm not good at math, but I, I believe the I believe the rise in popularity for three visits was exponential. That's that might be yeah. a good good word. But yeah, it, it went from it between 2018 and 2020. It was in 2,200 decks or so. So not that many at all for being a effectively very good card. Yeah. Um, hmm. It is in almost 200,000 decks now. <laughs> um, the, I, you heard me right, 200,000 because turns out when you chop a card's price in what like a 50th like that's <laughs> yeah, going to put a lot yeah. of yeah that's going to get a lot of players to play that card and it, it's it's awesome that we lead off with three visits and you mentioned nature's lore dana but nature's lore also got a very meaningful reprint and went from twenty three thousand decks to almost 184 thousand decks so it's also see, saw one reprint and did the exact same thing where so many people just latched onto this great great effect and put it in so many more decks these are absolutely wild. And Dana, I love the distinction that you've got there. It's just about whether these cards were like actually available and like it was never worth it to spend that type of money on a three visits. Yeah. No. There are other cards that like, I'm like, you know what? I can justify paying the the thirty dollars for for, for sure. this thing or like you know what crucible of worlds it's like 20 bucks right now or 25 or whatever and i'm just like that one's pretty interesting i've got ramen up as a, as a budget option but if i really want to splurge on this deck maybe i'll do both and i can kind of justify that in my brain three visits absolutely not i just absolutely can't do no that. no no like un unless you're in mono green just play far seek which is also like a dollar card right and, 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 and <laughs> instead of playing three visits and so like I, I guarantee all of you listeners, there's not 190,000 mono green players clamoring for three visits to get reprinted. <laughs> well, as long as we're talking about lands, here's one that I kind of want to uh, po poke a little at. The numbers are interesting to me because I remember when Command Beacon only ever showed up in the Commander 2015 product. 
And that was a very, very cool card that was unfortunately a rare land, and it only showed up in one of the decks instead of multiple of the decks. Command Beacon being the land that can tap, sacrifice, and put your commander from the command zone right into your hand so that you can avoid any commander tax. It's a really cool thing. And from 2018 to 2020, it showed up in about 9,300 decks or so. Well, lo and behold, it's finally gotten some dang reprintings, thank goodness. And it's now showing up in, oh my god, this number right, 96,241 decks for a percentage increase of like 927%, which is a lot. And I'm just like, yay, thank goodness, this card didn't need to be super exclusive. This is a fun one to play around with. I'm glad that it's accessible now. Yeah, I mean, this this is a card people knew existed, unlike three visits that that was printed in a set that you know most people didn't weren't even aware was a thing um let alone you just didn't see copies at your lgs people knew about command beacon it was just expensive it had that one printing in one of the earlier commander sets and people just didn't have access to that if the the influx of new players to the format that got it to the numbers we're looking at today came well after that initial printing so there just weren't enough copies to go around even if you did know about it well, and if you want to talk about a land cycle that people just didn't know about and forgot about, even though certain parts of the cycle had been reprinted, uh, Moss Fire Valley and Sky Cloud Expanse both oh. were cards that people just totally forgot about. They're, so they're part of the old, old filter lands back when Dana was in his prime. Uh, so these, you could <laughs> pay one mana and tap them. Today, and they would filter out today for, I'm in my prime, Matt. Today, d- d- Dana is in your prime. So yes, they were just recently reprinted in your prime. <laughs> oh, no. But but these lands you could filter out, so they were not quite the lore one filter lands. Um, you could only get a mana of each color, but you could filter it for two lands if you paid a colors and tapped them. But Mossfire Valley and Sky Cloud Expanse weren't ever really reprinted, and so they just sat there for a long, long time with people just kind of thinking, oh, I guess it's kind of like the the time spiral cycle where like you only got a couple of them for each cycle. But once they got reprinted, they both went up over a thousand percent in how much they were played compared to mm. the, the prior two years. That is just a massive jump for cards that they weren't expensive and they're still not expensive. They're both like 50 cents. Yeah, well, and so that's the interesting thing with these, right? Like Mossfire Valley, it was showing up in nearly 2,500 back in the 2018 to 2020 two-year chunk, and now it's in 31,000, and it's similar numbers for the SkyCloud Expanse. I remember when the other versions of these uh, got reprinted in like the 2016 set, a couple of these filter slash, uh, some people call them signet lands, were printed in the four-color commander precons, but these two weren't. And then finally, in more recent years, they finally actually got in reprints and now they're showing up in just as many and they're super cheap to get uh, now, which is like, thank goodness, because there was no reason for these to have been omitted from that first reprinting for the other ones in the first place. So like, thank goodness, we're finally able to complete the cycle. Yeah, th- th- these were absolutely lands that should have been in every precon since the beginning of time, basically, instead of like things like guild gates. They're, they're actually quite useful. They were never terribly expensive. You know, the reality is I think we all acknowledge there's a certain amount of reprint equity they're going to put in these products. Like you're not going to probably find a hundred dollars worth of reprints in a $30 commander deck, but mm-hmm. these weren't, these, these were cheap enough. They definitely, particularly in the early days, just should have been in those decks. And, and I'm glad they've finally gotten around to reprinting them to make them accessible because they are an, an excellent budget dual land. Well, and one card too that... Oh yeah. Honestly, it probably could have been put into Commander Precon decks, but it got so expensive so quick and was an older card, but then came rapidly crashing down is Rings of Bright Hearth. So that's a card that a lot of players never really knew existed until it got reprinted. Um, so Rings of Bright Hearth is three mana for an artifact that says whenever you activate an ability, if it is not a mana ability, you may pay two generic mana. If you do, copy that ability and you may choose new targets for that copy. So there's always been a whole bunch of like Strionic Resonator type of effects. And this is just another card if you have a lot of abilities that you're activating, you're able to copy this. I really, I've always enjoyed Rings of Bright Hearth, but it was a $40 card for forever. And yeah. so it not only was it price restrictive, but just nobody was ever playing it because it got so expensive so fast. And so it had so many factors working against it. So when it finally did get reprinted, it went down. It's, it's a $5 card. It's it's still not cheap, and but like it's so much more accessible. And this is, to me, I, I know, Dana, you love Three Visits as being a poster child for this effect. I think Rings of Bright Hearth is a fantastic, probably one of my favorite examples of this because it went from 6,200 decks to now it's in almost 48,000 decks. So it went up over 600%. And that's just a fantastic thing for just, it's just a very good card. It's not going to break anything, 
but it just it, right out of the gate, it got really expensive and just people forgot about it. Well, and it's a card that that has a lot of uses too. You know, if you're are you playing a planeswalker? Well, you can copy those abilities. Are, mm-hmm. are you playing a command commander with a with an activated ability? Well, you can copy that ability. Um, but when it was, you know, only had one printing back in Lorwyn in, you know, the early 2000s and was an expensive card, well, it was much more difficult to kind of casually include that in your deck. Whereas after that reprint and it, you know, f- falls down to being a five-ish dollar card, well, then it's much easier to be like, oh, e- even if I just use it on this Planeswalker in the command zone or my commander in the command zone with the ability, yeah, I can, I can, I'll spend $5 on that. Like it, it became one of those cards that people were willing to, to just experiment with and try out in a way they absolutely were not when it was $40, $50. Yeah, that is an extremely clever piece of tech. And oh man, the Planeswalker stuff too. Like that is definitely where I remember like when I was occasionally trying a Super Friends deck, I'm like, ooh, I'd really love a Rings of Bright Heart to double up all of these right. activated abilities that are loyalty abilities. But you know what? Um, getting this card would be, doubling the price of the deck that I'm trying to build. So maybe, maybe not. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and that's why it went from, you know, being in 6,000 decks to being in just under 50,000 decks. Right. Yeah. yeah. Like this is, this is important. This is like a thing that we used to see a whole lot, especially, and, and we still kind of see echoes of it in the data today, but like Swords to Plowshares is a more popular card on EDH rec than Path to Exile, even though they're both enormously like staple of the format, hugely popular cards. But Swords to Plowshares was a much more accessible and cheaper card for a lot longer, whereas Path the exile for a very long time straight in the five to eight dollar range and still sometimes sneaks on back up there because of the applications of that card in other formats as opposed to swords which has a much more limited range in, in other formats so like that is definitely a thing that we see where price can affect the popularity of these things and i'm just happy when these things come back down and we can actually like finally mess around with these these, these fun cards and you know what that actually is going to bring me to one that i was so happy to see reprinted most recently and that's the card patriarch's bidding oh man i was so happy to get this from my zombie deck because patriarch's bidding has each player choose a creature type and then each player returns all creatures of a card type chosen this way from their graveyard to the battlefield like that one back and i think it was the 2018 commander precon cycle where we had the ur dragon and edgar markov and all of those i remember this card jumping up quite a lot in price because those were all of the commander precons that cared about creature types and back then it was only showing up in like 3200 decks it finally got reprinted recently and now it's in 30 thousand decks like this is my favorite i'm so happy that this one's finally able to get into players hands yeah i mean it's it's the kind of thing like every time you would build or anyone out there would would build some kind of a a deck that you know cares about one specific creature type you're you're building a werewolf themed deck or a vampire themed deck uh you'd probably want to run Patriarch's Bidding. And it, it, every time that happened, and very frequently in the last few years, we've got a lot of sets that cared about specific creature types like that. Patriarch's Bidding went up, went up and went up. So seeing that card drop down in price to the point where people were able to put it in all of those decks, yeah, completely makes sense why it went from you know 3,000 decks to, to 30,000 on EDH rack over that window. Well, and we're kind of honestly a little lucky that it hasn't gotten higher because if you look at the most popular themes on EDH rec, you'll notice <laughs> that the most popular theme always happens to be building around one specific creature type. That's just the most popular theme that you see in all of Commander. And so it's when you have a card that is so impactful, if you're playing any deck built around one specific creature type, It's this is just one that you want to play. And so many of those top most popular creature types are also in black. Mm-hmm. Like they're the five color dragons, zombies, which tend to be blue and black. Elves are now very common in green and black. Vampires, which are red and black. Humans, which tend to be white and black. <laughs> like it's really mm-hmm. like this is a card that a lot of those things care about. So, yeah. Well, so we've primarily been talking about the the reprints here that that increase the number um, of decks these card appears in in a positive way. But I don't know if all of these necessarily uh, qualify as as a a, a good thing. And uh oh, the ones I'm in particular thinking of are the Diamond Cycle, which are the the two mana rocks that come into play tapped and make the appropriate color. So Moss Diamond is a two mana mana rock that comes into play tapped and you can tap it for a green mana. You know, those were in less than 10,000 decks for, for all of the ones in the cycle. And after they got reprinted in Commander Legends, we saw a, a huge jump, 500% at the lowest end in all of them. So we we see them going from, you know, seven-ish thousand decks up to almost 70,000 decks 
uh, anywhere from a 500% to an almost 900% uh, uh, increase in how often those were used. And I don't think they're very good cards, actually. <laughs> I think people being able to be included in their, their decks maybe isn't the, the best thing out there. I think there are so many better options for mana rocks than, than a two mana rock that comes into play tapped. But apparently not everyone agreed because they showed up in a lot more lists than they used to. Oh yeah, this is this will be a fun topic. Like, and and that's not the only place that is relevant for them to have uh, been reprinted and like popularly accessible and stuff too. Like the Baldur's Gate set, I think, also had these in there too. Mm-hmm. Um, so like these are certainly uh, the kind of things that a lot of people are able to get a hands on, and that's important. Like it's important for yes. us to recognize mm-hmm. that like just having access to the cards in general is like one of the things that's going to cause people to put these into their decks because I mean you just you need the actual cards to play the game, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but Dana, I have to say, I rather agree with you. I'm not a huge fan of the diamond cycle myself either. It's almost like they have a lot of two mana rocks in the format right now that have a lot of extra utility and abilities that they can provide you that might be more important than providing a single colored mana. You know, I'm a fan of liquid metal torque. I think cards like guardian idol and ebony fly are very interesting. Matt, I know that there's a new mana rock coming up that you're over the moon for too. I don't Mm -hmm. remember the name, but it's a really neat one. So planar atlas. uh, Yeah, that's another two mana rock that I absolutely love. So I mean, if you're playing, any of the diamonds this is just such a great upgrade to that because you get an etb trigger you get to look at the top four cards of your library uh, you can reveal a land put on top of your library put the other three on the bottom i think that's just a very very good ability to make sure you know, if you're casting this in the first few turns of the game you're making sure you're hitting all your land drops yeah uh this is great i i love this card and a lot of times too the the, the situation here is well the, these cards got reprinted and they're and they're very inexpensive now and, and so people can run them absolutely in, yeah. in place of something else that's that's maybe too expensive and i and i get that logic except for in this case most of the two mana rocks that you could run in place of the diamonds aren't necessarily that expensive you know mind stone has been reprinted into the ground it's very very cheap ever flowing chalice is very very cheap mm. like a metal torque is very very cheap like you can get almost anything that would compete with these for a slot for roughly the same price as these cost. so i think this is an example where people saw the cards that hadn't been reprinted in a long time and scrambled to get them in decks even if they maybe weren't the best choice i mean i i'm not going to fault anybody for playing cards for budget reasons though and of course, all of, course, of these of cards i mean they're 10 15 cents they're cheaper than a gumball though that's absolutely the kind of card if you're playing it because of budget reasons then yeah i i'm for sure all in favor of people playing this um maybe not the green one because you have so many non <laughs> yeah. so you have so many Three good visits for yeah. example yeah you <laughs> <laughs> Who knew that that card? But yes, you, you get a whole bunch of really good other budget. You can you do mana ramp through your lands in green. Um, so maybe not the green one getting so much love, but everything else, yes, I absolutely understand. And I'm not going to fault anybody for making budget decisions. Yeah. And let's make sure that that's especially totally understood is that like for us, we're looking at, the, at these purely from a strategic lens. It's just like these are, yes, these are certainly, these got very, very popular because they were very, very easy to get. And that is for us an interesting thing that we want to observe about the, you know, importance of these reprints. Like that is the power of a reprint is that like Mm -hmm. you know when uh, certain cards are put into those positions where they are hugely accessible well we we really hope that watsi chooses cards that are like not just like there but also like that are good for us and these are cards that are like there but they're not always the best for us and we hope that watsi is just like hey let's not have the blue white talisman skip a couple of reprintings throughout like four different pre-con right. opportunities every so often like that's that's kind of the energy i think we're trying to get with is just like Absolutely. budget budget play within your means every single time we're going to advocate for that but we're also like watsy can we get the good stuff though instead of the right. diamond stuff though right. like, that's what we're trying to say yeah for sure oh man and dana bringing it full circle with the three visits that was really funny dude all right well (laughs) we'll we'll take a break there i think we've got a couple of other things that we want to hit on for these two but for now yeah we're going to take a quick break because guys we have some stats to challenge let's pause for that one thing we as magic players love is accessories whether it's sleeves and deck boxes to protect your cards or ways to show off your favorite decks one thing you shouldn't forget about is wearing your own personal deck box And by that, I mean Tommy John underwear. Tommy John underwear is like casting a Hydro Blast on your nether void to make sure you stay cool and comfortable. Tommy John's breathable, lightweight fabric has four times the stretch of competing brands. Plus, the breathable, moisture-wicking fabric keeps you two to three times cooler and dries four to five times faster than regular cotton. 
I love wearing my Tommy John second skin t-shirts because they help keep my upstairs as comfortable as the underwear keeps my downstairs. With over 18 million pairs sold, people love Tommy John underwear, which is why Tommy John doesn't have customers. They have fanatics, kind of like a fanatic of Mogus, except for your underwear. Don't put yourself into a painful quandary with regular underwear. Give yourself a release to the wind with Tommy John underwear. Plus, everything is backed with Tommy John's best pair you'll ever wear or its free guarantee. Go to TommyJohn.com EDH right now for 20% off your first order. 20% off at TommyJohn.com EDH. TommyJohn.com EDH. See site for details. The first challenge we have this week is from a listener, the OG Idris. You can find them on Twitter at the underscore OG underscore Idris. I'm going to assume that's probably Idris Elba. Um, <laughs> big, big, big fan of the show. <laughs> yes, definitely. I think that, that seems, seems reasonable, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the, the, the challenge here is is for Tavash Gloom Summoner decks, and in particular, Mortarian Demon Primarch. Um, Mortarian is a creature that... Uh, six mana, uh, and at the your at your end step, you can spend X mana and put into play X two two zombies. Basically, um, for each point of life you gained that turn, or at least up to that amount. Um, so basically, in a Tavash deck, you're looking to gain life, and you're going to spend the life you gained at the end of the turn to make a giant demon creature. Um, as someone who plays Tavash, one of the problems in that deck is you are building so many things around life gain that a lot of times you don't necessarily have a lot of creatures back to defend yourself with. You're focused so much on getting everything into building these one or two big demons to kind of one or two shot somebody. Um, you can be pretty vulnerable and being able to put up a giant wall of zombies that nobody can fight through <laughs> just for doing the thing you're already doing is very, very useful. Um, I want to not, I have not put it in my Tavash deck yet, but I actually, I, I have a copy of this card sitting on my desk that I keep trying to find room for. So I am totally in agreement with uh, the OG Idris here. And currently it's only in one Tavash deck on ADH rec of the 350 ish that are out there. Oh. It's, yeah, it's a new card. And yes, I think there a lot of the Warhammer decks people haven't had a chance to even get a hold of yet. Hmm. Um, so there, there, there's reasons for that, but it should definitely see more play. It's a fantastic card in that deck. Just like a really good card in general, I think, if your commander is doing life gain stuff. And it, it, it should see more play overall, but especially in Tavash Gloom Summoner. So, fun fact, Dana, you're not the only one with a Mortarion on the desk next oh, to them. <laughs> nice. Because I am pretty certain that at this point I'm going to move my Graven Predator Captain deck into a Mortarion deck instead. Um, this is a, a subject that we covered a little bit ago, but Graven has that habit of, like, I thunder down one player and then they have to sit out of the game for, like, 10, 15, up to half an hour. Yes. And I'm like, I want a different energy in that, so I'm trying out Mortarion. And so far, I've liked it. He's definitely not as thunderous as, as my previous deck <laughs> sure but that's what i'm after and so i really i just i really like this card it's a, a very fun ability to to play with fire play on the on a knife's edge so i hope to see it in your list very soon well well, well thank you um to joey for for wanting to see that and thank you to the og idris for suggesting it yes thank you idris elba that is the best all right let's move <laughs> on now to my challenge here uh my challenge is actually kind of also related to a a warhammer ish card that came out specifically the card illuminor zeras was printed which is a legendary artifact creature that can tap sacrifice another creature of yours and you add an amount of black mana equal to the sacrifice creature's mana value and this made me remember a card that I've been tinkering around with and that I forget how much I love. It's Soldevi Adnate. This is a two mana cleric, a one two in black that can tap and sacrifice a black or artifact creature to add an amount of black mana equal to that creature's casting cost to your mana pool. So it is a two mana thing that you sacrifice one of your creatures and then you get mana for it. This is not going to provide you the consistent mana value that like a leaden mirror or other small mana dorks at two mana will usually do where they're giving you additional mana each turn. But that's okay, because what it does do is provide you with a quick burst of mana to play maybe your commander and one other awesome thing in the same turn. And that can be really, really spicy, especially if you're in a deck that cares about sacrificing stuff or can recur whatever you just sacrificed. So this is an interesting mana dork that can give you cool bursts of mana, and I just absolutely love this thing. I have forgotten how much I love this thing. It's showing up in just about 6,000 decks right now, but I'm tinkering more with it in my decks and listeners. I hope that you do as well. Okay, Matt, let's round it out with you. Well, my challenge this week is going to be for a whole category of cards. And 
that's a pretty broad stroke, but for the specific commander we're talking about, it actually kind of checks out when you look at it. So this week we're going to talk about Abaddon the Despoiler. So that's from the Warhammer 40k precons. It is the Grixis commander that is 5-5 uh, five five with trample. It says, during your turn, spells you cast from your hand with mana value X or less have Cascade, where X is the total amount of life your opponents have lost this turn. So this deck likes to Cascade, as it says, with the commander's abilities. So you're getting just a ton of value from every single spell that you cast on your turn, as long as your opponent's have lost a little bit of life. But if you remember, whenever we talk about other famous Cascade commanders, there's a certain card type that we're not a big fan of that we're actually seeing folks play quite a bit of, and that is counter spells. And yes, leave leave it to me to tell people, don't play counter spells, don't play blue. Oh, it's such a terrible color. Uh. But <laughs> when you look at these types of decks, they're playing not just a bunch of counter spells, but they're playing a bunch of cheap counter spells. They're playing stuff like Swan Song. They're playing stuff like the OG counter spell. So there's a lot of stuff in there that you're able to cascade into that you don't necessarily want to be doing that. You're just losing value at that point. So if you're playing an offer you can't refuse, like all of these are in at least 10% of Abaddon decks and you absolutely just don't want to be doing that. If you're playing counter spells, play those higher mana value ones so you're not cascading into all of those. If you're playing stuff like Spell Swindle, you're still going to have those counter spells. You're going to be able to protect your valuable stuff. Yes, it's a little bit more on the mana value side, but you're not going to accidentally cascade into it and then lose yourself a whole bunch of value. That's where you really kind of pin yourself down and you don't want to be doing that. So if you're those Abaddon players or you're building the deck, make sure you're avoiding those cheap and efficient counter spells. It feels really weird saying this because we love cheap and efficient counter spells in this format, but at the same time, you're going to be losing value. So make sure that you're just being critical of the what cards you're putting in there and not just copying and pasting because you might encounter some of these non-bows. Yep, Cascade and Counter Spells are very an infamous pairing, an infamous non-bow since the dawn of time, or rather since the dawn of, of Cascade. Yeah, good shout, Matt. Also, um, did we all mention Warhammer cards in our challenge of stats this week? Probably. I mean it's a I think so, yeah. it's a very popular, very powerful set. A lot of when we were at the MTG summit a few weeks ago, I saw a ton of Warhammer 40k commanders. <laughs> yeah. There are so many out there. They're, they're just great. So many people are excited to play them and they're powerful. So Matt, I just have to, uh, are you willing to discuss how much we were paid by Watsy to shill for these products? <laughs> yada, yada, yada. I, I have not been paid enough to buy one, if that's what you're asking. Um, if Watsy would like to pay me in Warhammer 40k precon decks, I, I'm not going to say no, but at the same time, um, I have not been paid enough to buy even a single card from I, I i can't buy the new basic play i, I don't know yeah i uh, yeah no i just i went for a low blow because of course we, we, we had to, because right. of course let's, we have to be paid to like things yeah yeah it's the only way you can like things right all right let's get into let's get back to uh to to the topic moving out of challenges stats now i am curious to hear from you guys like we saw a lot of data in the first half of the show but i actually want to shift us now Having observed the impact that some of those, just like a reprint in Baldur's Gate, just a reprint in this precon, just a reprint in these small places here and there, how that could have affected the the, the, tra the trajectory of a card, the popularity of a card. What are other cards that you hope will get the same treatment? Like, Dana, what is a card that you can't wait to get reprinted as a result of that? What are the things that you have your eyes on when it comes to cards that you hope Watsi gets around to redoing? Well, since we keep circling back to um, the three visits reprint, I guess I will I will talk about um, one of that card's distant cousins from the same set. Um, riding the Dilu horse is no. a is no. a sorcery. Um, That's not even a real card, card, is it? <laughs> Dana, oh, it, no. Dana. It, it is a real card. It gives a creature plus two, plus two in horsemanship, but because of some weird wording stuff with that set, it just gives it to it. It's not a until end of turn effect. So basically <laughs> it buffs your creature and makes it unblockable for good from that point onward. It's actually quite a useful card, particularly if you're playing some kind of a Voltron deck. Um, it, it, say if your commander has Hexproof, like you're playing Thrun the Last Troll, so it's also difficult to remove, so now your Thrun is buffed and unblockable. It, it, it's a very, very useful card in some decks. It's also a $250 <laughs> card, which is nuts for the effect. Again, it's, it's kind of like that three visits. It's useful, but it's not $250 useful. 
And that's a card that they could very easily reprint in literally almost any set and have it not be that impactful. Um, and it, 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 the price would just absolutely crater. It, it should get a reprint for some of those people that want to play that style deck and, and want to be able to mess around by just forever giving their commander uh, unblockable and a buff. You know that they won't, though, because a perpetuity effect like this is not going to be a thing that they're like, it's, oh, yeah, we're proud of this part of our history. Like, you know. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely a weird mechanic that I think that they probably don't want to keep re- don't, don't want to bring back into the fold. Feels a little bit like uh, it's something arena only, but yeah. I mean, the card badly could use a reprint. They can just change the <laughs> oracle text to say, put a horsemanship counter onto the creature and it's, sure, yeah, it's fixed yes. right there. It wouldn't be any weirder than some of the changes they've made to cars. The reprint would need to have reminder text on it that says this effect does not end at the end of turn. And you know what? All right, Dana, I'm I'm like a little salty with you for picking this one because I'm just like, come on, buddy. This card is the weirdest piece of magic history ever. But you know what? In terms of like updating like text and, and like while that's on my mind, the enchantment reconnaissance would be a really good thing to reprint for similar reasons to get like updated Oracle text on that one because mm-hmm. that card does not do what it says on the card like you can actually deal damage and still remove creatures from combat with the card reconnaissance so like that is a a, a rules thing that i would love to see a reprint for that one too just just to make sure that things are like properly updated and understood uh okay you know what i'm i'm Riding the Delu horse. Matt, what's your pick? What do you want to see get reprinted? <laughs> you called it by its name. That's that's how you know you're really bad. That's what my mom used to do. It was, it was always Matthew Morgan, not just, not just Matt. <laughs> um, so one thing I, I observed when we were kind of researching this episode was five of the top seven commanders over the past two years all are at least $15, if not more. You know, you have stuff like the Ur Dragon that is obscenely abs- uh, expensive, along with uh, Edgar Markov and other, other very, very powerful and popular commanders. Mm. And so I would love to see the next time we get a Commander Legends or whatever it is that we're getting a massive reprint outlet, that we get some of these very popular commanders reprinted down. So the only one of the top seven commanders that has gotten a reprint, just period, is a Traxa. Huh. Nothing else has gotten a reprint. And granted, some of them are fairly recent. You have uh, the, the new Omnath, for example. It's only a couple years old. It really hasn't had a chance to get reprinted. But at the same time, we've had some reprint heavy sets and these have been popular since the get-go. Corvold. I, I hate saying we should reprint Corvold, <laughs> but also it's just an expensive card. And yes, it, it's popular for reasons. Very powerful. And just some players like playing that high power magic. And if that's the case, then I, I hate for them to be price restricted and not be able to play some of these very, very powerful commanders. Because, yeah, it's it just uh, having the all of these cards accessible is going to be great. And especially when they're the commanders, that's what the deck is built around. Having price accessible commanders is is huge. Now, I, I do like that players have gone for alternates. They've gone for more niche strategies and more niche commanders to build around. I, I do like that trend that we've kind of picked up on. But at the same time, they're also some of the most popular commanders of all time. I, I think that it would be nice to have more copies in the hands of players to be built around. The Air Dragon is 90 dollars edgar markov that hurts my like body 80 yeah it, yeah i sold oh, my edgar like just, markov for not 80 dollars and it really hurts for new my countertops <laughs> yeah <laughs> oh yeah oh i feel you on that uh, one. the ur dragon paid to have my basement refinished not really but it, <laughs> it, it's not a hypothetical really yeah. all right i will move to one of my examples here i really watsy please why does the card champion's helm only have one uh, printing why why so that's the three mana equipment equipped creature gets plus two plus two and if it's legendary it also gets hexproof and it equips for one this showed up in the first uh, set of precons i think it was in the kalia deck and like that's it okay sure it has a a one of those kaladesh inventions printings we know that does not count that is a super premium no one's got it that's not a meaningful reprint like watsi please champion's helm it is beautiful it's a really good card why has it not been reprinted let us please sir may we have some more i don't know what to say i just want this card to get a reprinting please yeah i mean sometimes it's a matter of like you just want it to get reprinted because you like the card too yeah uh, <laughs> and this is a card that yeah, champion's helm is really easy to like it's like, like it's a commander card like there's few things that feel more commandery than that and the fact that it, it it's not 
very affordable for most players is ridiculous. It's talking specifically about legendary creatures, and this format is about legendary creatures. So yeah, yeah. if you want a commandery card to reprint, then this there's nothing more commandery than a card talking about your commanders. Right. Legendary creatures have been like um, a huge part of a whole bunch of the most recent sets, like as draft sub themes and stuff. I'm like, champion self could go anywhere. Anyway, I need to simmer down. Dana, let's just move it back to you. <laughs> um, you know, there, there's a cycle of, of two mana, mana rocks that I really wish would get reprinted instead of the diamond cycle. And <laughs> yes, maybe they wouldn't have worked as well in Commander Legends as the diamonds, but we badly need a reprint of the medallion cycle. Oh. Now, maybe they're not truly mana rocks because they, they, they just sit there and reduce the cost of the appropriate colored spell versus tapping for mana. But they're fantastic in monocolor decks, and there's a lot of two-color decks where they do a ton of work as well. The only one that's had a had a reprint had a printing in foil at all is is the one that showed up in the the recent uh, post Malone secret lair. But none of them have ever had a foil printing, and the last printing for most of them was in the monocolor um, commander decks back in was it 2015 when we got the first planeswalker commanders. 2014, I think. Yeah, 2014. Some of them are crazy expensive. The cheapest one is the green one, and I think that one is around ten dollars. Most of the rest of them are over twenty into the thirty dollar range. Yeah. They're excellent cards that definitely should get a reprint way before I think the diamonds. Um, and you know, people that like foils want their first foil version of those as well, me included. So that's a cycle we really need to reprint for a whole bunch of reasons. Yes, just yes. Like I don't even I don't even want to play them. Like I'm, I actually wouldn't even use them in, in a bunch of the decks that I've got. I've got commanders that care about activated abilities that these wouldn't help cut, reduce the cost of. Like Sir Conrad doesn't need doesn't need that. But I, I'm like, why is it twenty bucks? Why is it thirty bucks? Doesn't need to be thirty bucks. Doesn't need to be thirty bucks. I, so if we're going to talk about cycles of cards, then I, I have a cycle that I would love to see reprinted. Uh, that's the Kindred cycle. And so these were in the same Commander Precon cycle that the Ur-Dragon was printed in, that mm. all these Commander creature decks were built around. Um, Kindred Dominance is not a cheap card anymore. Um, all of these were just, they're super powerful, they're super cool design, but they're, like, they're just creeping up. Oh yeah, honestly, like Kindred Discovery getting a reprint in the Baldur's Gate set was like, a, oh, thank goodness! <laughs> like this one, it, it's no longer a thirty-ish dollar card or whatever, and it would be really fantastic to see Kindred Dominance, the black, like choose a creature type, destroy everything that isn't that creature type. Oh, it would be very nice if that card was also like, I mean, because again, like there are so many decks that you're building around a certain creature type where you're like, I I would love to have a one-sided board wipe, please and thank you. That'd be fantastic to get access to. So like, I hope that the dominance can go the way of the discovery. Well, not even just the, the two expensive ones, but they're also, both of this whole cycle, they're so old at this point that a lot of players weren't playing when they were originally printed. So even stuff like Kindred Charge, it's, it's relatively more accessible. It's only like a $7 card or so. But if you're playing a deck built around a specific creature type, this is fantastic. It is a, a great way to just overrun the game. Um, you're making a token that's a copy of all of your creatures and they all get haste and you just run them over. <laughs> and like, it's not, it's not super cheap, but it's also, it's not terribly expensive, but it's just, it's just forgotten about. Like, generally, they're all great card design. They're great in the format. We just don't get to see them very often and they either get forgotten about or they're too expensive for a majority of players. Well, okay, so Matt, as long as you're talking about six mana red cards for Commander, and as long as you're talking about cards that get forgotten about for Commander... There's a pun I, here. I'm, I'm waiting for it. Not, it is not a pun. Okay. I want Fiendish Duo to be printed in okay. a thing where people will know about it, please. Because Fiendish Duo is amazing, but I don't even know what product it's from. It's like a, a Game night product thing that was like a, like a, a starter kind of pack or whatever, but it's just such a good card. And since it is only available in this one very niche thing that isn't like a proper set release, it's like a $30 card. Fiendish Duo is the six mana devil, five, five with first strike. If a source would deal damage to an opponent, it deals double that damage to that player instead. Ah. <sighs> I did that. I've lived. I've lost my capacity to podcast. That is such a good. That's so good. The, the words are so good. Joey, did you like, did you have the ability to podcast before? I don't know. <laughs> also, in this vein, is the card Rot Hulk. Can we talk about Rot Hulk? That's the zombie that gets back a bunch of your zombies from your graveyard as well. I think everyone understands what I mean when I say this. <laughs> it, well, yeah, it, though, though, they're they're very very good cards and the price on them was out of control and, and they were difficult to get. Like you, Joey mentioned, they, they were in the Game Nights product, which you could only get actually if you left 
like a stocking out and, and Josh Lee Kwai would come down your chimney and if you left him sriracha, he would maybe leave you with one of those game nights cards in your stocking. And if you didn't do that, you didn't get one, which is why very few of us have them. Um, I need to clarify real quick that the product is game night with an N, not night with a K. These are distinct entities, but that's extremely funny. I, I, I agree to disagree, Joey. I, 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 that's how I... <laughs> I mean, I, 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 rumor has it Lady Danger is still making more of those than her back <laughs> office. She just can't keep up with demand. And, and poor Ashlyn Rose. I mean, she's just working her butt off. I don't. We the EDA track cast accused of saying that Command Zone is not reprinting enough of the cards. <laughs> more news at 11. This will be the online drama of the week. And All Jimmy right, we, Wong is nowhere to be seen. <laughs> we're just, just Matt, take us to another example. We've gone off these rails. Uh, I, so, so I will talk about um, I just th- so we've gotten so many cards and I hate that I keep saying they need to reprint more cards from Commander decks. But also, that's kind of a compliment because they're just such a fantastic place to introduce these new cards, but we just never see them again. So I'm going to talk about cards like Pathbreaker, Ibex, and Orin Frostfang. All these cards that they've never gotten. A, we, we mentioned earlier in the podcast a meaningful reprint. Secret layers. It, it you shouldn't have to buy a fifty dollar package of cards to get one ten dollar card, one fifteen dollar card that you really want. Just give us that card in, in a mainline set. Make it more accessible for players. But th- there's stuff like there's stuff that people have forgotten about. Scale Lord Reckoner is an actual card, and you may not know what that is, but it's an old dragon that protects your dragons, and it's a fantastic card. But it's just been such a long time since it's been printed. Or if you want a wonderful combat trick that I think only Dana has actually ever played, Benefactor's Drought. Love that card. That's a great way. If if combat's going on, you can cast that. It untaps all creatures, and whenever a creature blocks, you draw a card. Yeah. It doesn't have to be your creatures. You, you can let somebody else attack for lethal, and somebody has to block. It's just a fantastic card. But all there's just been such a glut of fantastic cards, and I hate that this sounds like a complaint, because it really isn't. But I just would love to see some of these cards come back because players are going to see some of these fantastic designs. You know, and it takes pressure off Watsy's design team. Recycle some of these fantastic cards that we just haven't seen in forever that also are getting out of you know, out of the price range of so, so many players. Arachnogenesis is $30. And what? it's one of our favorite fogs. What? Ever. Who? When it's thir- yeah no I'm I'm seeing right now it is above thirty dollars on according to two different well, websites and like and like I I realize that we we all three of us have been playing for a while so I remember being able to actually find copies of Song of the Dryads in the wilds yeah that just doesn't happen anymore you can't go to an LGS and find a lot of these cards and so players just don't even know they exist and and to like I'm very very I totally get why there it's difficult to find reprint avenues for so many of these cards like we mentioned the diamonds earlier and we're not a huge fan of the diamonds but I also understand that for the limited environments in which they were made if you went with something as strong as the talismans or the signets in those card slots instead the draft format would probably be a little bit uh, a little bit sketchy because those are extraordinarily powerful mana fixers for to use colorless mana for and you can't just throw some of these cards into a regular standard environment like we've seen what the reprinting of Thoughtseize could do to a whole standard environment before. Right. They have to be very careful about all of this. We understand. We just also don't want the $30 Surprise Spiders Arachnogenesis card because it's just, it's it's one of our favorites and we want everyone to enjoy it. <laughs> Everybody should have a chance to cl- to cast Imp's Mischief in, in a black deck and, and redirect a spell. But, but given it hasn't been reprinted in, you know, 15 years and it's a $30 card, that's not something Wait, no, what? have access to. It is a $30 card. It is indeed. Why? Yeah. Well, it hasn't got a it hasn't had a printing since Planar Chaos, and it's it's closing in on thirty dollars. That's the kind of craziness here we're talking about. The the more you know, like yeah, there, there's just so many of these cards that I, we've just if you've been playing for a few years, you're like, oh yeah, that card's probably like four or five dollars. None of right, none yeah. of these cards are four or five dollars anymore, <laughs> and it's just because a there's the 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 player base for Commander has exploded. I and mm. I I love that there's so many new players, but also. Sometimes it just feels like Watsy just can't keep up with all of these new players that just want all these great cards. 
but also we can, yeah, it's just finding that balance. And it, it's not an envious position to be in yeah. for the, 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 the team that has to handle reprints. I get that. It's, it's, yeah, there's, they're doing what they can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's no $4 cards right now aside from Zatalpa Primal Dawn. Everything else is more than, more than $4 <laughs> except for Zatalpa. Because it said what? 142 reprints since it came out. I mean, three visits isn't even four dollars anymore. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, <laughs> that is the thing too, right? That's what it what makes us feel like the dagger sometimes gets a little bit like uh, twisted. We're just like, okay, so we can't have Champion's Helm, but we can have the forty eighth printing of Zatalpa Primal Dawn, <laughs> like that. Right. That that card's been reprinted more than Basic Land. You know, like just that mm-hmm. one's that one's a little bit a little bit hard sometimes. And like that's the thing that makes us feel like, ah, oh, come on, you guys, you're so close. <laughs> Oh no! Any other examples that you guys want to shout out? Any other cards that you're like, oh, we got to I can't forget to say this one. I, I mean, the last one I would mention because there, there's plenty of cards we could we could talk about. How it would be nice if the Great Hinge was affordable, or you know, Me Took Massacre. That's a whole I don't know, twelve months old, and is it is still crazy expensive despite being banned basically everywhere. Um, Nick though, Shrine of Nix. If, if you're playing a one or two color deck, is an amazing commander card. That's pretty difficult to pick up at twenty five dollars for a lot of people. Mm. So I mean, it, it, I think we could, if we wanted to, talk for ten hours here about cards that need reprints. But I think, at least for me, those are the ones that really jump out at me. Yeah, the the one that's left on my list is the card Necromancy because as a necromancer myself, <laughs> Matt, I said but the thing you did. You um, did. I really like this card. <laughs> like, if Animate Dead can get a whole bunch of reprintings, and that's a really efficient, fantastic way to get creatures back from the graveyard and have an enchantment stuck to it. And if the enchantment dies, then the creature will go back to the graveyard. Necromancy is another fantastic addition to that list, mm-hmm. and it can sometimes be cast with Flash for a quick combat trick if you want. I think the difficulty with this one is that, like, to reprint it, you need to put a novel onto a very small area on a piece of cardboard so I, I am sympathetic to how difficult it would be to reprint this one but since it's like 15 dollars now i'm like oh this is a this this would be a nice card to get also new art it could use some new art i think would be would be nice because the original art's a little bit creepy you, you know it could use a reprint that hasn't seen one and also needs new art colossal dreadmaw that hasn't been reprinted enough <laughs> matthew <laughs> it's, it's fighting Z- zatalpa it is <laughs> But okay, but seriously, so actually from around that same time too, the commander, like the the cycle of spells from the, I believe it was a Coria pre-constructed decks where uh, if you had your commander out, you could cast them for free. That whole cycle probably was a little bit of push in, as far as power level goes, but also you have cards like Deadly Rollick that was just fantastic, but Dead, Deadly Rollick is the third most popular card in that cycle and it's still $40. That is ridiculous uh deflecting swat is also very very good and it's fifty dollars and then fierce guardianship is sixty dollars so like you have the scale of these are getting so expensive and they're great commander cards they were designed for commander and i mean flawless maneuver is probably my favorite and that one never that's the one that actually doesn't feel bad to actually cast (laughs) Uh, but that's still twenty dollars so like i mean you have four of the five are twenty are north of twenty dollars they're all great but you just we haven't seen them yet, and I, I know that Wizards of Coast runs on a, you know, a two year cycle from when they figure something out to when we actually see it happen. But this was one. This is one cycle that they had to know these were going to be powerful and popular, and you you would think that they would put that on their radar to, to get reprinted before it became price restrictive to put it in a pre con again. Because like gone are the days when True Name Nemesis is the chase card in pre constructed decks, and right. Commander's a thing now, so. When you design cards for Commander, it's going to, like, your, your high demand cards, they're going to get pricey quick. And so just, I would love to see Wizards of the Coast anticipate when these cards are going to be a little more in high demand and then kind of head that off at the pass, so to speak, mm. um, before it actually gets out of hand. Because then you can't put them in pre decks anymore if they get too pricey too quick. Yes. Right. That's always the issue, right? It's that like once you put one high cost card, it, you're, you're into a, one of the pre-cons, it's sort of taking up all of the rest of the reprint value according to whatever mathematics they're doing for how much a pre-con can, can certainly cost or whatever. And that's, that's the difficult thing. It's just like, we just want good products. We just want good fun stuff. And when they come up with some of these cards that turn into chase rares, like Teferi's Protection or whatever, like it makes sense why you don't want them showing up in every single precon. And you also want the precons to have a 
a modest amount of fair that they're like allowing room for new cards to also be able to shine rather than just us constantly hitting the same old favorites over and over again. And you don't want them to be like just full of the chase stuff. So then only enfranchised players are getting them for the value as opposed to allowing new players to actually see them sitting there on the shelves. Like it's all very complicated for sure. But it is just kind of like, man, some of these chase cards, we don't see a new version of them for like a while. It took a couple of years for Dockside to get back around to us. It took a couple of years for Teferi's Protection to get a new printing and more frequency, please. More frequency, Bitta. We would, that would be a, a nice thing to get, um, even though like there are good reasons sometimes why we can't have all of them in the places where we hope they would be. All right. Well, well Dana, I think but before Joey has an aneurysm, we just need to, to kibosh the show um let's wrap it up because I, I i think we're all getting a little little animated about all this <laughs> are you saying that uh, maybe i have lost my ability to podcast a couple of times i, on this I episode? mean <laughs> your eye has been twitching for about 15 minutes and <laughs> you've you've ridden the dilu horse right off the cliff <laughs> Well, he wow. well, he's beaten the Dilu horse to death. And <laughs> right. There we go. Oh, wow. Oh, goodness. Well, OK. Yes, I suppose it's true. <laughs> I have lost my ability to podcast. So we're going to call this episode to a close. Our is. listeners would like to get in touch with us and let us know about the cards that they hope get reprints soon as well. Fellas, where is it that they can find us all? Matt? So you can find me on the Twitters at Mathemus55. That's M-A-T-H-I-M-U-S-5-5. And don't forget, Wednesday evenings, we are streaming over at twitch.tv slash EDH Retcast. We have guests on every single week. It's always a super fun time. So make sure you tune in for a lot of laughs, a lot of silly games. But also, it's just our guests are super cool. So come on and hang out. And Dana. You can find me on Twitter at Dana Roach. You can find me on my other podcast once a week, CMDR Central. I'm writing articles for EDH Rec and Commander's Herald. And you can find all of us together at patreon.com slash EDH Recast. And I'm Joey Schultz. You can find me on all the socials at Joseph M. Schultz. And you can find the cast at EDH Recast on Facebook and on Twitter. Plus, if you've got a question for us, you can contact us at EDH Recast at gmail.com. Our thanks go out once again to Chase for assisting me with the post-production of the show. You can find them online at Mana Curves. And listeners, we'll be back at you next week with more data and insights. But until then, remember, EDH wreck your deck before you wreck your deck. <laughs>